All right, you ever curious Hurley Burleyites, we've got a hell of a pod for you today. It is most definitely Doug Ford's Ontario, and you're just living in it. Whether or not that floats your boat, the prime architect of Doug's landslide is our guest today, Corey Tonight. Corey's been on the show before. In fact, his coming on here with me to wipe away my tears after the 2018 election held the record for our most listened to show way back in the early days of the Hurley Burley. You all know Mr. Tonight, good Saskatchewan boy. It's why I'm wearing my Riders jersey today. Former comms director to Prime Minister Harper and campaign manager for Doug Ford in both the 2018 and 2022 elections. Cast your mind back over two years ago and recall the fix Mr. Ford seemed to be in. His popularity, well, if it wasn't rock bottom, it was the layer of moss and weird roly-poly bugs that separate the rock from the bottom. What changed? We'll dive deep into the details of the winning strategy with Corey, and we'll also ask him about what surprised him about the other campaigns. Corey tonight, welcome back to the Hurley Burley, and thank you for doing this while it's so fresh after Election Day. My pleasure, uh, David. I, I, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of your podcast, and uh, I think like most uh, most people was listening to the Curse of Politics every morning uh, uh, and uh, enjoying the commentary. And uh, uh, anyway, so I'm, it's, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm a big fan. Well, thank you. And congratulations on the win. Um, let's just start off with a really broad question. The people who voted for Doug Ford, what were they voting for? I think for for uh, stability and uh, and and for and for growth to, to essentially to move on. I think from the pandemic, I think there was a comfort around his leadership uh, that developed over the course of of COVID. I think there was certainly an evolution, maybe a bit in him, but more in the perception of him. Uh, I think he lived very much under the shadow of his his brother in the la- going to the last campaign, and I, I think he was able to kind of come into his own and and uh, establish a brand that was was truer to who he is. I know, I th- so maybe said more simply, people just got to know him. Uh, and, uh, but I think the, the campaign was not about that. It was not about COVID things. It was about a plan and a vision for moving forward and, and essentially putting COVID behind us. And, and insofar as other campaigns wanted to dredge that back up, I think they were, they were not uh, uh, with the mood of the electorate, so to speak. So it's so interesting that you would say that. So because there was no lack of things that went terribly in Ontario during COVID, whether it's the government's fault or not. And there were no there was no shortage of mistakes and they weren't unique in this, but they did make mistakes throughout COVID. And there were times when, as we said in the intro, that people were really fucking down on Doug Mm -hmm. during COVID. But you're saying that what emerged from that was some sort of gestalt image that was better than the one he had going in. What was that? Well, I think uh, as is often the case around intent and, and while people will point out, you know, moments of, of anger or disappointment with, with, you know, various leaders uh, during COVID. And I don't think there's anyone who was in, in power during that period that didn't have those moments. What, what's different though, uh, David, with, with, with the premier, with Doug Ford is he's, he's almost like, you know, if you think back to Ralph Klein and his, uh, and 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 the and the and the strength of his brand is the ability to say, oh, I got it wrong, and and to be genuine about that, and to allow people to say, yeah, okay, and move on. So you know, if you're you know, if you were to pull around this, and we did a lot of pulling around this, what is the consensus view of of the Ford government during the pandemic? Didn't get everything right, but did the best they could under the circumstances. That's really what. You know, you get 70% of the province saying yes to. Uh, not perfect, but did the best they could in a difficult circumstance. And, you know, when something didn't go right or wasn't, wasn't you know, wasn't perfect, to apologize and, and move on. It's also, you know, the, the public aren't stupid. You get a lot of conflicting advice. You know, there were a lot of experts during COVID. And uh, you had some saying black and some saying white and some saying, you know, neither it's purple you know it, you had a lot of different advice on everything from you know if you think back to uh, uh, to when you get your third dose of vaccine you know booster shots things like that you, you have people saying no save those for the third world and you're and others saying no you gotta you gotta give them to everyone here so we keep the schools open you know you had other people saying no schools are the main source of spread so you know, you got to do that so you don't kill the people in long-term care you have lots and lots of different conflicting sure. advice 
And, yeah. uh, and anyone who says that there's somebody who somehow miraculously got all that right, uh, they'll lie to you about other things. If you, look, <laughs> if, if, you, if you look at all the baseline statistics, though, you know, Ontario did, at the end of the day, do a very good job. Uh, if you're looking at deaths per capita, if you're, you know, which is a horrible metric to, to, to have to even talk about. But, but if you were to use metrics like that, well, you know, much better than Quebec. Way, way, way better than New York. Way, way, way better than Florida, Texas, you know, all kinds of places, the prairies, Alberta, um, you know, uh, British Columbia. You know, we, you know, we stood up well by comparison. And, right. th- and that's not lost on people either. I think COVID was very much a comparative experience in terms of how do you look compared to others? The other thing, not to belabor this, because I, I don't think the campaign was ultimately about it, but um, you know, I think one of the reasons we were able to f- come out of that and fare better is, is we had a much more unity of voice. Um, uh, if, if we had taken the approach that, say, Jason Kenney did, we would be where Jason Kenney is in the political graveyard. And, uh, and, and we didn't. Uh, we, uh, we had some minority, a minority of voices within our caucus that were anti-vax, that were, you know, shake their fist at, uh, at the scientific community, the medical community, and, and, uh, and, and uh, we showed them the door. Uh, you know, we ultimately lost five caucus members in the lead up to the campaign. But what we got uh, in return was a clarity of message that, that I think was absolutely critical. Interesting. Super interesting. Hey, what, just a couple of big questions before we get into really into the weeds on this, which I want to do, <laughs> but what, what is, um, what, what do you attribute the low voter turnout to? Satisfaction with the government over, overwhelmingly, you know, as you know, David, like, you know, if, if you were uh, fighting for a you know, campaign manager for an opposition politician, and you saw that you're going to have record turnout in that election, what would you take away? Government's I'm going to win. Gonna change. Yeah, yeah. You're going to win. You know, yeah. and, and if you see low voter turnout and you're managing the incumbents campaign, what do you, what do you hear? You're going to win. And, uh, and we saw this in all, in all our research and all our focus testing. You know, we did, you know, and going to last week, we were doing gro- groups uh, with just liberal and NDP supporters because we wanted to see whether there was going to be some sort of surge towards one side of the progressive ballot or the other, as often happens. There was yeah. no surge coming. And we didn't see a surge because both sides didn't see a clear person who was ahead. But more importantly, both sides uh, were resigned to afford victory and content with it. Well, that's very different than what we saw in the last election campaign, where there was a surge and there was no content amongst opposition politicians. They thought that, you know, uh, Sauron or Lord Vader or someone was going to be taking over the premiership if Doug Ford was elected. Yeah. That was just gone. You know, so Doug Ford is not scary uh, to uh, most opposition party voters. And uh, and so low voter turnout, uh, I think it I think it hurt the liberals most. Uh, but it was was pretty much across the board from support for, for everyone was down. But it, it's about contentment. So you know, low voter turnout is not a, a mm-hmm. damnation of your electoral process. It's, it's just a sign of of uh, complacency and satisfaction with the government as, as it has always been for elections for as long as we've done polling. So I buy that. I think that makes a lot of sense. But can I ask you whether, because I'm trying to reconcile different things I'm hearing, was any of did was any of the people who didn't turn out conservatives who were either angry about lockdowns or uh, you know uh, deficits and a, a conservative campaign that didn't really look like a conservative campaign per se? Um, how many conservatives were left on the table? Oh, I, th- I think a lot, but not for those reasons. I think there are more shoulder voters who are just low motivation. Um, you know, I, I th- and I, I can talk a little bit about the sort of PPC Ontario Party type folks, if you want. If you're looking at the PPC, uh, I, I would say, uh, uh, and I'll get in trouble for, for this, but I'm going to say it anyway. But there's like a, a, a third of them are are basically alternative voters like they're voting for the libertarian party or the christian heritage party or you know the the uh 
Sorry, guys. My phone rings through to my iPad. Uh, <laughs> uh, the, but, but you've got basically people who, who, who never have supported a mainstream party. They're about a third of their base. A third are, are free man on the land, sort of libertarian types. You know, this, this is like Max Bernier type people. And a third are what I call the placenta eaters. These are these are sort of more <laughs> routinely Green Party supporters. You know, hundred mile diet. Uh, you know, uh, only organic food enters my body. Um, you know, the, the maybe have dreadlocks. Uh, you know, but there is a, a and they tend to be middle aged female. Like there, there is a there is a group of people there who are are you know if they're not uh, with that group they're probably voting Green or something else. Uh, but the, the free man on the land folks, you know, we got most of the, the, them back. And uh, I think, uh, frankly, the only votes moved by the, by the liberal gun ban uh, policies and promises were to move those people back to our party. So thank you very much, liberal campaign. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let's go back to a year ago. You start planning this thing out. Yeah. How <clears throat> how did the positioning of get it done, the Yes Express? How did that come together? How did you? What were you looking at in terms of what people wanted and how you could respond to it that led you to that positioning? Well, first first of all, uh, a lot of research, uh, in which uh, uh, you know my my equal partner and in, in, in managing this and coming up with this, uh, you know, was very much. Uh, Nick Cavallis, who yeah. is uh, an incredibly good pollster. He's, uh, he's really good at this. Eh? Yeah, yeah he's, he's very good. Mm. Very good at voter segmentation. Very good at uh, you know, seeing through the numbers with some clarity what the, what the path is. So uh, we'll say a huge, huge part of that. And, you know, and I think in some, some of the verbiage comes, comes from focus groups. Some of it comes from, from our team. We had a really, really great advertising team. Um, uh, led by uh, Dennis Matthews and, and Lauren McDonald. At, uh, Dennis Creative Matthews, Grants. good friend, good friend of the Hurley Burley Pod. Yeah, uh, and mm-hmm. and an incredibly talented marketing person. Uh, you know, uh, so the the Get It Done theme song was was uh, get, get It Done is is very much Dennis's idea, his his uh, his genius there. But the the song, I think, it's he and uh, Tom Edmondson at Pirate Radio are also uh, pretty fantastic, uh, talented folks. Um, but uh, it, it, the, it, there's a practical element to that framing, which is very much consistent with the premier and uh, how people view him, but also who he is, right? There's an authenticity to the Doug Ford brand uh, that you can't make up. You can't you know, create that with an ad. Uh, he's the guy who, if you, you know, get stuck in a snowbank, uh, shells your car out, he's the guy who... If a box of Max need to be delivered, puts them in his truck and drives them there. Like uh, he, there is there is that element to who he is as a as a leader and a politician that shines through, and it's not contrived. It's it's just there. And so, getting it done is just a, a verbal embodiment of of uh, of that of that brand. And 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 as a result, it's very believable for folks. Right. And and would you say it's non ideological? Would you say no. you were asking people to vote conservative, or were you asking people to vote for this Ford vision? Uh, it, it, it's 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 way more of a personal brand than it is an ideological brand. Like when when the premier says, "I'm not you know red or blue or or purple or green or whatever," I'm you know Doug Ford. He means that. Like he certainly, in terms of his own personal philosophy, skews more to the right. He's he's more. Uh, you know, free market uh, in in his views, etc. But but he is not a, a partisan, and um, he does not view the world through that lens. In my experience, he's somebody who's very comfortable working with people in other parties, and he's very much about practical accomplishments. Uh, which is, I think, one of the reasons why he's been able to work very well with uh, you know with John Tory in, in in Toronto, but also Justin Trudeau federally, and and with premiers. Uh, across every different stripe, like uh, he and Legault get along famously, he and Horgan get along famously, he and Scott Moe get along famously. Like, these are very different people uh, with very different uh, worldviews, but uh, uh, but his approach is very much 
what is it that we have in common? What is it that we can get done together and do that and less about some sort of partisan frame or positioning? So then what is it about the PC Party of Ontario that makes it more immune to the demands of movement conservatives than the party is federally or in some other provinces? Well, it certainly hasn't been immune to it in the past. I don't think there's anything intrinsically about the party, because if you were to look at, at you know, the Tim Hudak uh, era, and, you know, and Tim is an incredibly talented, I think, charismatic guy, uh, you know, but at the end of the day, I think movement conservatives are the reason why uh, Working Families Coalition, uh, you know, came along and, and helped thump him. Um, and uh, why, you know, in the opposite approach is why they were campaigning for us. Uh, this time out. So, you know, I, it, it's not like they haven't been there, but, you know, uh, power is helpful. Like, I think Doug came in looking more like a movement conservative uh, in many ways. He was, you know, a disruptor um, and, 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 and swept in uh, in a very unique set of circumstances that I, I think would be almost impossible to replicate. But once you are in power, you have the ability to define uh, what your caucus looks like and what you're going to do. And and it's not like we didn't have some of those folks. We talked about that earlier. We said goodbye to them. Yeah. And, um, and, and, and that's, you know, a big part of the reason why we are where we are. It's what Jeffrey Simpson famously called in his book, The Discipline of Power. Yeah. Yeah. It's why opposition parties are always uh, at each other's throats and government parties generally hanging together. Yeah, yeah, I think yeah. That's, there's, there's a lot of truth to that, but you know, it's so it's a it's an unusual set of circumstances. But there's nothing intrinsically in, about the Ontario PC party that makes it immune to those sorts of forces. All right. All right, Hurley Burleyites. These next couple of weeks, we're going to dive deep into what I think is both a surprising and even better than that, potentially hopeful climate message. Let me verbally underline potentially because it involves an idea about government policy that isn't yet in place, or maybe even thought about. It comes from our presenting sponsor, TELUS, and how, as a company driven by social purpose, they put the well-being of customers, communities, and the planet first. Here's the idea. Digital policy is climate policy, or at least the evidence dramatically suggests it should be. It comes from Farpoint Report, Farpoint is an independent technology consultancy based in the UK. When you boil it all down, the key finding is that best practice digital policy must be embedded in Canada's climate policy in order to reach our commitment to net zero by 2050. Let me give you some stats. With more widespread digital adoption, i.e. high-speed connectivity across all of rural and urban Canada, we could see a reduction in greenhouse gas emissions of between 120 to 190 megatons. That's the equivalent of 40 to 60% of our Paris targets. More of us could work effectively from home, access healthcare and education more efficiently. Businesses could operate more efficiently and successfully with digital tools. Think of the impact of fewer cars and trucks on the road, shorter, more efficient routes for trains, planes, and cargo ships. Entire sectors like energy, industry, transport, land use, waste, and agriculture would see dramatic reductions in their emissions through digital optimization. It all comes down to finding a way to make sure we're all digitally included in the most efficient way possible. That's TELUS's hope. But there's a barrier to all of this that we've talked about here before. It's the spectrum squatting going on right now by regional carriers that keeps entire communities from participating in high-speed connectivity. Don't fret if you've forgotten the details. We're going to talk a lot more about it next week. Hey, how much, you mentioned Dennis Matthews and the advertising. How, how, what percentage of your budget did you spend on advertising? Oh, total percentage? Jeez, I'd have to go back and calculate, but uh, it'd be over 50%, but less than 60 Okay. And, and where was it? What kind of advertising was it? It's more difficult to follow that these days uh, yeah. than it used to be. Well, some, you know, we, the last time, campaign, uh, you know, four years ago, we had this conversation some, at, at some length. Very similar to the last time, you know, we, uh, uh, we did a little bit more traditional TV in terms of dollars this time than last time, but it's simply because the Leafs were in the playoffs for the first part of the campaign. Right. And those, those are very expensive ads, but I think worthwhile ads to buy. 
uh, but that pushed that that number up higher than would have otherwise been the case. Um, digital and other, you know, yeah, live uh, events are really when television shines yeah. now. Yeah, right? and particularly sporting. Um, you know, uh, I think uh, news plus so now there's so many streaming options uh, available to you. Uh, and we can talk more about that later because uh, that impacts uh, how you treat the media big time. But um, b- but uh, we did a lot more in-app uh, advertising this time. You know, we we're talking a lot about highways and uh, traffic congestion and things like that. So we did a lot of advertising on ways, um, uh, things like that. Uh, that that was different than last time. Uh, we did a bunch of point of sale. Uh, like There you are, folks. Four weeks of distracted drivers due to the Ontario PC <laughs> campaign. <laughs> How many people did you kill? How many people did you kill? <laughs> uh, <clears throat> I, I, my car was the only, my, the only casualty this campaign, <laughs> as far as I'm aware. I like the fact that you have Magnum's car. I just hope you're not wearing Magnum shorts. <laughs> no, there's a, there's, a muni- there's a municipal bylaw in Ottawa against that, actually. Uh, specific to me. Yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, advertising. That's so interesting. You're into the you're into the uh, uh, the ways and the apps that people have to look at all the time when they're driving now. Um, and obviously, a lot of digital. And was it mostly negative or was it mostly positive? Uh, I'd say it was about a 70-30 mix uh, in the pre-writ and about a 60-40 mix in, in the, the writ of uh, uh, negative to positive, negative being being higher. Yeah. Uh, we, we, we took a very regional strategy in terms of our negative ads, though. So, um, we ran very negative ads on NDP throughout the campaign, but mostly in areas that you would suspect where we're on two-way races. Yep. And we ran very negative ads on the Liberals in areas where we're up against them, but you know, right down to you know specific ridings. Um, there are a couple of markets where I think we got it a bit wrong to our detriment. Like I think uh, we pushed the Liberal vote uh, down uh, lower than we should have in Ottawa. Uh, uh, if we wanted to win back Ottawa West Nepean, but uh, um, but it wasn't enough to keep you know allow us to win Orleans. So like I think that's an area where we mm. we probably got the mix wrong. Um, but uh, you know I, I I think we 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 went into it wanting to have the opposition tied and support, and I think we came about as close to that as you can uh, statistically speaking. Point one per, point one of a percentage point. So yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. I feel it, it feels like that. What were the attacks that were sticking to the NDP and the Liberals? Uh, well, I think for for the NDP, it's that their leader was a Karen uh, uh, in the uh, parlance of uh, modern meme culture, and uh, uh, with no constructive solutions on anything. And 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 I think there are some things that she did that really hurt her with the public. One was when we raised the minimum wage to fifteen dollars an hour, and she couldn't come out and say, well, I'm happy you finally did that. You know, it was like, no, it should be 17. Well, her website is saying 15. Like things like that are, are very uh, on brand for her negative brand, so to speak. Uh, right. And, uh, you know, I, you were talking about her, her brand earlier, uh, you know, on, on your uh, Curse of Politics show about how she had a very positive brand. She had a very positive brand until she was attacked, just like everyone else in politics. And when we turned on her halfway through the last campaign, her negative spiked and, yeah. and we never stopped attacking her for four years. And, uh, we, you know, we've ran millions of ads, uh, on the NDP and, uh, pushing on the open door. That is that perception of them. Like they're not viewed as being constructive. They're not viewed as having any solution. They're, uh, they're not viewed as a viable alternative for government. They're just viewed as perpetual critics, uh, who, you know, if, uh, Doug Ford cured cancer. Would go out and complain about how many cancer workers uh, you know, he's uh, he's cost the jobs of. Right? It's just uh, uh, there's just a nasty unconstructiveness to to the tone and the approach. Um, and so th- that's that's really so naturally. So naturally, the Liberal Party should join them. Yeah. Well, you know the the Liberals had a, you know a different issue. The Liberals had had the baggage of of uh, you know having been in government for a long time and people weren't you know, I haven't quite forgiven them or forgotten them yet. 
uh, on, 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 on some of those issues. And, you know, I don't want to be uh, uncharitable because I think he's a very nice guy. Um, uh, I think his wife's even nicer. Uh, but Stephen Del Duca, you know, lacked a, a charisma uh, and ability to translate, uh, you know, uh, a positive image to the public. You know, he was sort of uh, viewed as this sort of wonky guy that wasn't relatable and uh, wasn't particularly likable. And, um, uh, you know, and nobody could kind of figure out what he was talking about. Uh, you know, when you test and say, so what are, what's the liberal campaign about? Nobody could tell you. Um, they, and, and not even a coherent attack on us. And I think this is true of both opposition parties. You know, I think you have to make a case for why the government is bad and needs to be gone. And then you need to follow on with that a case as to what you're going to do that's different and better. And the NDP have been terrible at the second uh, you know, step of that. The Liberals, I think, traditionally have been very good at it. Um, but I think they didn't either uh, right. in this campaign. Right. Um, did you expect more Liberal votes at the end than there were? No, no, they landed pretty much exactly where we had them. Okay, because there were some polls throughout the campaign that were showing them in the higher 20s, and that would have made a significant difference in seat count had that been the case, right? Well, let's let's talk about why that is. But, you know, we've talked privately about this, but um, it's uh, a lot of pollsters, and, you know, including Greg Weil, who's who's been a good friend of your program, uh, don't don't test party and leader and party. They test party. Right. And, and that is invariably in the province of Ontario going to give you a different result um, uh, than you would otherwise get. You know, uh, party and leader, if you were testing party and leader throughout, you would have gotten the right number. But uh, the not doing that uh, is, you know, was, was bad in two ways. It was having our vote look lower because there's brand confusion with the federal conservative party who's going through a leadership race and trying to talk to 3% of the electorate, not 100% of the electorate. And so... I'd say in the front half of the campaign, uh, uh, the federal leadership candidates were getting more press than the provincial campaign. And you were seeing them uh, acting as a ballot drag for us if you didn't include the leader name. Uh, Interesting. And, and you were you were seeing the opposite for, uh, for Del Duca and the Liberals. You were seeing people thinking that you're talking about Justin Trudeau. Um, so that, that's why, you know, uh, I, I could probably do a whole podcast uh, nitpicking the polling, uh, including a lot of it, Greg Lyles, uh, you know, who, who, by the way, last election uh, uh, predicted a liberal or sorry, an NDP minority. So, you know, his, 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 his approach and his numbers and his outcomes have improved in four years. Um, but, you know, not not doing things like that methodologically, you know, you're going to get it. You're going to get a blown result and I got a blown result. Okay, so the liberal vote was never higher than the mid twenties. In actuality, I, I think they at, at peak periods, not during the campaign, but in the lead up, at various points, it would get up to like twenty eight, you know, and then they float back down to to twenty five. But always flittering in that margin of error. There was never there was never a clear uh, 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 alternative, and. Uh, Oh, and interestingly, as Del Duca became more known, his unpopularity increased. To yeah. know him was not to love him. It was the opposite. And was it what he was saying or who he was? It's both. Uh, but, you know, it's, it's, hard, it's hard to detach the two, I think. Uh, you know, uh, but I think there's, there's an element of both. Uh, it needs to be a clear message. Uh, I think it's hard to distance yourself uh, from being a senior cabinet minister in a, in a previous administration to say, oh, I had nothing to do with any of that. That's not viewed as being credible. So you can't run away from it, but, you know, you can't embrace it either. It's a very, very difficult position. And, you know, all things being equal, this is why most parties that have been knocked out of power don't come back at the next election and take power again. It's, it's, it's maybe an impossible task. Uh, it's very, very difficult. It's, I don't know, it's like being down uh, 3-0 in a, in a uh, hockey playoff series or something and coming back. Like, it's not that it's impossible. It's just very, very unlikely. Right. Well, so explain this to me, explain this to my listeners. So, he was tarnished by his association with the previous Liberal government that was still very unpopular. 
The things that, as I understand it, made the previous Liberal government unpopular, high hydro rates, big deficits, uh, crowded hospitals, all still exist. Well, hydro rates, uh, but, but we're not, but we're not issue, but we're not, we're not, but we're not issues. Uh, right? Yeah. Well, like uh, there's a lot that we can go through on those, but I'll, I'll, I'll point this out because I think you'll, you'll be happy to hear it. Well, the, the, the administration is still unpopular. Kathleen Wynne has become much more popular than she was. Uh, uh, which which I, I find I find unusual and strange, but you know even last campaign her popularity um, was was obviously very low, but people still thought she was well intended. She got the benefit of a doubt uh, on intent, and I'm going to suggest that that's probably why her popularity has has come back more than than it has for the party. Um, I, I think uh, you know there's as you're a longer period of time in power, people you know your sins accumulate. Uh, and and your friends diminish like that's just uh, always the way it goes. I think the the, the screw ups around hydro were probably the biggest problems that the, the government had, and that were a lot. That was about a lot more than hydro rates. That was about you know gas plants you know, where you pay for them and then you don't open them. It's about you know uh, very close friends of the government getting very wealthy on uh, renewable energy contracts. So there's sort of an insiderness. It's a six million dollar man. It's a privatization of Hydro One, which is still the single most unpopular thing the government did uh, during that period, and it comes up all the time when you when you're in groups. It's still I think the number one uh, mistake that was was made. Um, so, you know, uh, and I'll quibble about, you know, the government spending, like a lot of the spending that we've done is 10 year, you know, capital spending, which is not on your balance sheet in the same way. Uh, but, uh, I think it's also, you know, in keeping with what the public sees needing to happen, you know, if you don't want to have shutdowns because of the pandemic, you can't run, uh, your hospital system at 99% capacity in regular times because, then if there is a, a health emergency like COVID, you have to shut down everything that isn't COVID in order to do that. And then eventually your entire economy and the cost of actually making increased investments in our healthcare system uh, is much less than the cost of the economic cost of shutdowns and, uh, and the, and the longer term health costs of, of, uh, you know, pausing uh, uh, elective surgeries, et cetera. So, but that's not an Ontario unique problem. That is a, Canada-wide problem, and I think it's one of the biggest challenges that will be facing uh, this government and all governments over the next, you know, four or five years. Yeah, for sure. Well, CN's birthday was this week. The railway, our sponsor, was founded on June 6, 1919. In recent years, CN has taken to celebrating the anniversary by giving back to the communities along its network. Working with the charitable fund that relies on donations from its current and retired employees, CN singles out worthy projects for financial help, with a particular focus on volunteering. Let me give you an example. In Montreal, a group of parents decided 10 years ago to establish a project that would provide housing stability, independence, and dignity to those with special needs. One of those parents was a former CN employee, and the company paid attention. La Par à Moi was exactly the sort of cause CN and its community fund want to support. Since 2012, the fund has channeled more than $400,000 to this group, and CN itself has sent a donation of $300,000. Today, La Par et Moi has a facility in St. Hubert, on Montreal's South Shore. Residents have their own studio apartments, and each is entitled to a place for life in the residence. How's that for an amazing guarantee in a market where stable, affordable housing is more elusive than ever? La Par et Moi has full-time staff, it offers shared meals and organized support. The goal is to enhance residents' integration into society. Simply put, La Poire à Moi represents the best of Canada. CN and its railroaders are absolutely delighted to see the project succeed. All this month, CN will be staging events highlighting similar causes and projects in the communities where it operates. Because that, dear listeners, is what good neighbors do. Hey, now that it's over... Show me some vulnerability. What, what, what were you afraid of? What might have happened in the campaign that worried you? Well, we could have had another big wave of COVID. That, that was definitely a worry. And uh, it looked like it was going to happen because if you look at when 
we had previous waves. Um, you know, if you think a year ago, May, June, we were in, we were in luck, we were in lockdown. And, yeah. uh, and if we're, and these things are very seasonal and, um, you know, the, that was, that was by far the biggest fear that we had. And, uh, and that's completely beyond your control. Um, but that would have been, that would have been devastating for us. Why? How would that have affected your perceptions of, of the government? Why wouldn't that have been a strength? Well, you can't change now. We've got COVID. These people are, you know, in charge. And, you, in, and as you said, there was a comfort level overall with Ford's management yeah. of COVID. Well, I think, I think COVID reaction to COVID and COVID policies for every party were very divisive in difficult to predict ways. Uh, I, th- I think we still would have won, uh, David, but I think the chances we would have had a minority would have been quite high. Um, and you know, there, there are a lot of people who are very angry through COVID angry at everything, angry at everyone. Uh, it's not like there was some path that you would make some people happy. You had some people, you know, literally wanting to punch you in the face if you wore a mask and you had other people wanting to punch you in the face if you weren't wearing a mask, like the, the amount of division in the country through that period. And, you know, which is just barely in the rear view mirror now is just so intense and so outside the normal lines of, of political uh, you know, preferences and voting behaviors that it really becomes a, a, a very wild, uh, difficult to predict election that you're dealing with uh, in which, you know, some of your friends are hating you and some of your enemies are loving you. Like it's a, it's a very bizarre environment true, to try yeah. to prosecute a campaign. It would have been and a very different dynamic. Yeah. And a lot of yeah. people just want it over. And also, frankly, a lot of people who who were you know struggling either financially or mentally or both. All right. All right. Let's talk about the NDP, because I think one of the most interesting things about the campaign was the offensive against the NDP in some of their traditional territory in their traditional demographics. Yeah. How did that come together? Where did you conceptualize the fact that they were vulnerable with working class voters in the Southwest and you could go after that? Well, it's, it's, it's been a long standing theory uh, that, uh, that some of us have had <clears throat> within the conservative movement, but I think with increasing evidence in many, many jurisdictions, that there's a, there's a, a longer term, you know, very deep realignment that's going on. Um, uh, with NDP, but also with, you know, traditional labor part, you know, parties that have been traditionally supported by private sector unions and labor movement. You see it in the U S as well, um, where there's this sort of woke urban base now of, uh, you know, uh, and public sector unions, uh, that are very, very different in their thinking than the sort of, uh, uniform, you know, steel workers, um, construction unions sort of folks, folks with steel toe boots and hard hats who shower at the end of the day, not the beginning. Like those, 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 those people think very differently um, increasingly than the woke, you know, urban, large urban base of the party. And there's a war going on for the soul of the NDP that's been going on for quite some time now. And it's starting to play out uh, at the ballot box and at the local level to a much greater extent. Uh, you've got, you know, the one side of that base with an NDP wants to cancel every pipeline project. They don't think we should be mining things and processing ore here. They don't think that we should be building cars here because they don't think we should be driving cars here. Uh, and, uh, and, and those people are, are basically trying to kill off the jobs of the other people. They're trying to put them out of work, trying to destroy their way of life, the value of their home, everything. Like it's a very existential fight. Uh, that's going on for people on the other side of that equation. And it's very clear who's not on their side now. And it's the leadership of the NDP federally and uh, and increasingly provincially, despite the fact that Andrew Horvath's pedigree comes from that side uh, of, uh, of the movement. Uh, her policies, positions, candidates, uh, the ethos of the party is not that. Whereas ours is. You know, we're about building things. We're about doing things. We're about supporting traditional industries as well. We're about helping evolve them. But, you know, we're, you know, we're actually there fighting for these folks. The biggest constraint on our, our economy right now is lack of workers. Like uh, We don't, we have a lot of things we need to build and do. A lot of factories that, you know, want to locate here. We don't have the people to work there. 
you know, like we have a skill shortage that is of epic proportions. And I think it's, it's perhaps the largest thing on the economic side of, of the ledger that we have to, to deal with as a province and as a country uh, over this next term of office is, is fixing that as best we can. And it's not everyone going and getting a degree in, in uh, feminist literature is as interesting as that is. You know, we need more people uh, learning how to weld, uh, learning how to, uh, uh, to, uh, to do high-end electronics, uh, learning how to do programming. Like there's the gaps are in a different part of the economy uh, than, than, you know, what has been valued by, uh, by some of the political leadership of the country. So would you would would you say that the 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 wokeness, the emphasis on culture and on the rights agenda is driving a wedge through the center left voting base? Yeah, I think it is. Absolutely. Uh, you know, tied with, uh, you know, uh, a certain complexion of environmentalism uh, that is that is also a part of that. You know what's what's interesting is is conservative voters are more environmental voters than 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 the pundit class and the media thinks. They're very concerned about those issues, but they have a different approach and a different mindset around it, a different view around it that is much more akin to what you know those that side of the NDP that we're talking about about how they think. You know. Uh, their idea of experiencing the outdoors might involve hunting. It might involve, you know, camping with their family uh, as opposed to, you know, riding their bikes through a park in an urban area. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, um, so you saw this opportunity. What's involved in executing on this? So I'm interested in two aspects of it. One of which is the machinations with the private sector unions. And, you know, by the time I saw Pat Dillon with Monty McNaughton, I was like, no mas, no mas, man, because that, <laughs> that is, I was in full Roberto Duran mode after that. But um, so there's that super interesting side of it. But then there's also a more granular side of it. Like, did you, did you send organizers into those regions a year ago and start working those regions especially hard? Or did you, what, what kind of tactics did you employ? I think on, on a government level, we spent four years uh, working very closely with them to to solve problems and issues that they were facing. And I, I think one of the big areas where we spend a lot of time as a government uh, is in putting more resources and funding into union training centers, which is, um, uh, you know, a great story to tell. You know, if you're looking at uh, union training centers, uh, you know, they graduate uh what do they do, uh, Corey, students. for my listeners? What do they do? So if you're an electrician, for instance, I'll use the, them as an example, uh, and you want to become an electrician, they'll train you to be an electrician to the same standard that you would if you went to, I don't know, Algonquin College in Ottawa or, you know, um, uh, George Brown here in Toronto or, you know, you name the college. Um, but, you know, you've likely come into that training center through a job site and you know what the job is that, electrician on job site is going to do and you're very interested in doing that and maybe you're making you know x dollars an hour and you want to make x times two dollars an hour by having that that uh increase in uh in wage associated with having a higher skill job but but these these run very efficiently and have very high graduation rates and very high job placement rates at the end whereas a lot of colleges uh are graduating less than 50 percent of the people from these programs and half of those people never work in the trade uh you know and they're there for other reasons they're there uh so they continue getting ei or something else like there's all kinds of reasons that they're brought in the door to fill those bums and seats so the college can get the money from the government for those for that training but the efficacy of it's very low. And so you know, one of the great uh, frustrations, I think, of a lot of people in the private sector union movement has been that, that uh, you know, the liberal government uh, before us uh, frustrated any expansion of those programs despite the higher efficacy. Uh, and, uh, you know, there's an obvious reason why they're cross-pressured with public sector unions representing those colleges uh, saying, no, 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 you don't want to do that. And so they just chose to do nothing. So, you know, we, we put a lot of resources into that. And, and I think for a very good reason, you know, what I talked about earlier, we're super short people in the skilled trades. And yeah. so I think that's one example of things that the government did to, to help bring those folks on side. 
But there's also a lot to be said for just re- developing relationships. There's no fast way to become old friends. You just got to spend time with people. Uh, you know, uh, I, I don't know what uh, Pat Dillon would say about me, but I'd say about Pat Dillon that I've gotten to know him very well over the last four years, and I consider him a friend. And, uh, uh, you know, we've spent a lot of time on that relationship and on, on other relationships like that. Are there conservatives in any number that would say, fuck doing a deal with Pat Dillon. That guy tried to kill us for four elections in a row. We should be killing him, not aligning with him. Well, I, I think Pat Dillon would say uh, he never wanted to kill uh, the Conservative Party or the PC Party. He wanted to stand up for, for his members and his workers, which is what his job was. And, uh, you know, uh, uh, I think uh, our party brought the fight to them in terms of some of the policies that we're talking about. Um, you know, we basically... Uh, the platform at the time of the party was a fundamental attack on organized labor in a, you know, in a way that would not have been reversible. And so the fact that those guys fought back is just called self-interested. If you come to my house and start breaking things, I'm not going to like you very much. And, and, you know, I, I don't think it's more, I don't think it's more complicated than that. Uh, and, you know, I don't think that the policies of the party was pursuing at that time, uh, we're smart politically, and I don't think they were smart economically or smart for our labor force. So, you know, it, we don't have a problem with too many people who are working class in this country making too much money. We have a problem with too many people uh, at the very, very tiny top of the pyramid making too much money. And uh, no, just above us, right, Corey? Those people yeah, just yeah, above right? us. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. But you know, if you're to talk about what you know, what are what are challenges? It's that it's it's like the capital. There's all kinds of things. But you know, it, I I think you can probably conclusively say uh, that uh, people who are you know building a bridge or uh, uh, you know building a condo building or building a house or working in a factory uh, are are not living you know so large that we have to go and solve that problem and make sure they make less money. Like that's just not. That's not a problem that we're facing. Right. Okay. Pre-COVID, Ford and Trudeau were sworn enemies. Ford's on the cover of McLean's as part of the resistance. Trudeau runs against Ford in 2019 in the election in Ontario. Uh, They both spend a lot of time bashing each other. Then all of a sudden, you start to hear some soft, romantic words out of Ford's mouth about Christia Freeland. Uh, for a bit, and then the next thing, you, next thing you know, there's a full blown love affair on, to the point where, as a liberal, I felt the feds were actively fucking Del Duca uh, in the run up to uh, to the election. How did that relationship come together, and what is the core basis for it? Well, the core basis is the premier himself. Like, um, you know, he uh, uh, you'll, you may be surprised, not surprised. I don't know. He's a very likable person, and he's a very practical person, which we talked about earlier. And uh, and his approach, uh, and you know, in my observation, has been: here are the things that we need to get done. Are you going to help, or are you not? And uh, and and it started by you know getting little things done, and then bigger things done, and then even bigger things done. And you know, it creates a little bit of a, of its own momentum. You know, I I, I don't think there's a, you know a high risk that uh, the Doug Ford is going to vote liberal in the next federal election, but I you know, uh, but you know, I don't know. Uh, it's a question for him, I guess. But like, it's it's not some partisan affiliation or desire to do that. But if you want to get subways built in Toronto, if you want to get you know our steel mills in Hamilton and Sault Ste. Marie upgraded, if you want to attract uh, new auto plants and battery plants uh, in southwestern Ontario, you cannot do it without uh, you know a th- at least a third of the money, often half, coming from the federal government. You can't do it. And so, you know, how are you going to do these things if we don't work together? And it's to the political uh, benefit, for sure, of the province and the premier to, to, to get things done, and also for the prime minister. And at a municipal level, also for John Tory and, you know, other mayors in large cities. It's, it's, it's good and it's popular when, when politicians at different levels of government cooperate and work together to try to accomplish things. We should see more of it. We should do more of it. Um, and I hope that we're laying out a, a good pathway of that it can be very politically successful if you do. Okay. I buy all that, Corey. And it is not important that our governments work together. But they did a fucking announcement with you after you had unveiled your buses. 
<laughs> well, what can I say? You know, that's, that's, <laughs> Um, you know, but look, it was, uh, you know, it was an opera. It's a good opportunity for all of us, but you know, like the, the, those are good questions for, you know, for Katie and for, for Ben Chan and, uh, and for those folks, I, 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 I have to say though, you know, like we, we've kept all of our MPPs out of the last federal election campaign. We stayed out of it, uh, and they're staying, you know, and then they stayed out of ours. I think that's, that's a good deal for both of us. Um, and, uh, you know, I think our, our folks are staying out of the federal leadership race too. I, I think there's a lot to be said for provincial parties, uh, and federal parties, uh, not playing in each other's backyards and the, the way that sometimes they have in the past. I don't think it's an interest of the uh, provincial PC party to be an activist in federal races of any complexion. And I don't see a big win for federal parties doing that. Uh, in provincial races. Uh, I think it confuses folks. I think it complicates your ballot and, and your campaign to, when you start doing that, who am I voting for? Is this about, you know, how I feel about this federal politician or the guy who's on the ballot provincially? Um, I, you know, I, I'm a big advocate of, uh, separation of federal and provincial politics as much as is possible. Okay. Um, so I'll, I'll wait a minute before I ask you about federal politics, then I'll just take a break. Um, <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of talk naturally in among the two opposition parties in Ontario since the election about leadership and about yeah. they both have they both are now on the hunt uh, for new leadership. In your experience in politics, all the people you've worked for, what are the components of really effective political leadership? Uh, I would probably put near the top of the list authenticity. You know, the idea that you have to be, you know, super charming, super uh, affable, all of that. Like there's a lot of different ways to make charisma work, like, uh, and, and be charismatic. Like, uh, you know, Trudeau has a version of charisma that, that is, you know, uh, you know, uh, his tooth uh, glints in the sun with a little ping, uh, you know, very, uh, very, you know, good looking, charming guy in one way. Uh, Premier Ford uh, uh, has uh, has a charm. Uh, uh, John Cretchen has a charm. You know, uh, Paul Martin had a charm. Uh, you know, uh, Brad Wall has a charm. So, you know, like there's lots of different ways that you can do that. But what I think the most successful folks are, what they have in common is the authenticity. You know, um, uh, Cretchen, probably one of the most successful federal politicians and, you know, in our lifetime, uh, yeah. never a smooth talker, like, um, uh, but charismatic. Yes. Authentic. Absolutely. Effective. Yes. Um you know, where you get in trouble is, you know, is, 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 uh, is, is when people don't know where you are and who you are and looks like you're moving around. And we've seen examples of, of, of that, uh, in every political party where, where either people don't know who you are and where you are, or you've changed where you are and who you are from, you know, your, your leadership campaign to a general election and people are confused by it. And they're like, maybe you're a bit of a, a shady operator here. I'm, I'm not sure what to think about you. Well, it's interesting that you would say that because I think there is a lot of authenticity to Ford. Um, oh, there is a, for sure. there is a, <clears throat> there is a lot of what you see, what you get. But I also feel like I've seen different versions of Doug Ford. I've seen the Dean French version of Doug Ford, and I've seen the Kieran Moore version of Doug Ford, and I've seen the Corey tonight Nick Kuvalis version of Ford. Leaves me wondering now that you go back to Rubicon, what Doug Ford am I going to get now? <laughs> Uh, well, I, I don't, I don't, I'm not sure that's entirely fair to the premier um, and that, you know, it's natural that you evolve a bit, but also people's perception of you evolves as they gather more data points. And, you know, it, you can have one or two interactions with somebody and draw big conclusions if those are the only interactions you have. Uh, I think the arc of Doug Ford is much, uh, is, you know, is much less pro pronounced if you've known him for a long time than uh, what the public perception of him is. And, and part of that, I think, is a, a decoupling of his brand from that of, of Rob Ford. And, um, and then I think part of that is just, uh, you know, uh, a transition from what was a very aggressive campaign that we ran last time. Like that was, that was a fight, you know, and we knew we'd been in a fight. Uh, and, uh, and we also ate 
you know, following close on, on the heels of that, a federal election campaign where we ate like another six million dollars of attack ads on them. Like the, the view of Doug Ford at the end of that, like anyone who's eaten, you know, millions of dollars of attack ads is not super fantastic. You know, you're you're that's going to leave a mark. And uh, through COVID, we were able to kind of present the premier every day. Um, you know, uh, you can't do, you know, 250 press conferences in a row yeah. and really uh, and really be hiding a lot of your true self. Like people are going to see who you are. And uh, and not surprisingly, that was better than uh, what they'd learned in 30 second attack ads from uh, from you, David, and from from uh, the federal uh, federal liberal team. <laughs> Yeah, it was one thing I could do. I, I I can only win occasionally, but I can always have a good attack at. I'm always good for a good attack at. <laughs> we, 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 we can all only win occasionally. That's like the, the truest thing in politics. If you're actually a pro in this business, you lose more than you win. Always, always, always. Um, okay, so um, the federal thing. I'm gathering you don't have a horse in the race, no. by the way you were talking. No, I, look, I, I, I committed uh, when I went to, to work for the premier uh, yep. that I would stay out of uh, federal politics and 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 will continue to, to take that approach because uh, uh, for the reasons I talked about, like I think there needs to be some separation there. Uh, I'm always happy to chat about it and obviously I have views like everyone else, but uh, in terms of just joining campaigns and working in that way, it's, it's something that I've um, you know, uh, I swore off uh, while we were going through this period, and and frankly, uh, now that uh, now that the election's over, I'm more more interested in getting through a transition, and then uh, maybe taking a couple of weeks off as opposed to starting another campaign. <laughs> it's going to be much better for for me and my family. Yeah, I believe that. I can believe that. So there's all kinds of talk um, in the country now after your election about to what extent you have set a template or a model for how to win elections. And you and I both know that every circumstance is different and every circumstance requires a different campaign. So it's not like it, not like anybody reasonable would suggest there's only one way to do this. But it is very, very clear that the Poiliev people have a very different view about how to animate the electorate and how to win, how to win a conservative government than the campaign you just ran. Um, yeah. What are your thoughts on what are your thoughts on those well, two different kinds of approaches? Well, I'm not sure they're they're analogous, uh, David, because like I know I'll, I'll talk about this because like I think I, I, a, a lot of why we were able to be successful is things that we did in government in the year leading up and being able to lay out a narrative and you know do a fall economic statement and a budget. And, and, and really, that is like the other half of the campaign team. We're talking about the campaign, but, um, you know, uh, is, is uh, a Jamie Wallace and Amin Masudi and, uh, you know, in particular, but the whole team of folks, uh, you know, our, our finance minister, Peter Bethlehem, Favi, others who, you know, who crafted that agenda, obviously, you know, working with the campaign team uh, through that, but you know, with the campaign team, you know, is very much, uh, as you know, second fiddle in that process. Like you're not, uh, you don't have the levers of power or the authority of government during those, those periods of time. That work is done by the people who are, in, who are actually managing the government. Uh, and, and that's really what, you know, allowed us to set that up for, for whether it's, it's Pierre or, or, or uh, you know, or Jean Charest or, or Patrick Brown or any of the other candidates, they're not leading a government. They can't do those things. And, and so, you know, you're already at a disadvantage. Uh, leaderships are also, you know, as you know, so polarizing and you're, 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 um, you're trying to solicit votes from a tiny percentage of the public, you know, a couple percent, two, three percent of the public that might possibly even consider uh, buying a membership and a tiny, tiny percentage of the public, like less than 0.1 are, are actually going to do so. Uh, so, you know, you're, you're narrow casting it in such an extreme way to win the leadership that it's, it's very difficult to then, you know, uh, immediately tack to something that, that has a broader appeal. And so you've got this trade-off between how much of that do I have to do to win versus how much, do you know if I do that too much? Do I, you know, get a poison chalice at the end of this, where I 
I've won the leadership, but I've, I've absolutely fucked myself in terms of, of uh, uh, the general electorate. As you know, I, I can say for, you know, and it's not particular to this leadership race, but almost every leadership race, if you in a general election ran on the platform of, I don't care the party, what the leadership candidates are running on in a general election, you're going to lose. Like, you know, there's too much niche stuff, uh, I think, uh, too much narrow casting going on. So it's, it's, it's very tricky. You know, uh, what I'd be most worried about, irrespective of who, uh, you know, ends up uh, victorious in the, uh, in the federal leadership race, is uh, that the federal liberals will call an election immediately. You know, or that, that, at least that's what I would do. And um, uh, while, while they're still tied to, you know, very narrow cast platforms and, and images, you know, that's, that's probably when you want to do it. And, 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 you know, we've lived through that before. That's, uh, that's what happened to Stockwell Day, for right. instance. Right. Okay. Super interesting. Hey, just one last question occurred to me, puzzling over it. Why did you guys change your policy on the disability benefit? Uh, it was genuinely a miss, I think. Like, uh, you know, I, I, there's no, there's no great political gain for us, or I think great. That's why. That's why I was asking. It wasn't an issue uh, in the election. Uh, you no, know, it's just. Uh, it, 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 you know, um, uh, our government is uh, fallible, just like anyone else's, and and it was genuinely a mess. And uh, and I think, uh, you know, I think that's in keeping with what we talked about at the premier. Like he's he's he is not afraid to uh, say I missed something or we got something wrong. Like he doesn't feel any lack. So he of, heard about that, and he heard about that, and he said, "Well, what the fuck are we doing to disabled people? We got to increase the benefit." Is that what he said? Well, well, we 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 did increases for you know yeah. around inflation for uh, you know all other kinds of social assistance programs. I think we put another billion and a half dollars into it. It's not like we were unaware that this was an issue. It's just for for some reason that one didn't get caught up in the package, and and uh, uh, you know, and and it was a miss. So, you know, uh, but uh, I think there's, I think there's a larger reform that's probably required in that area. And, you know, and those are the sorts of things when you come in in your first term, um, they're not, you know, top of the pile, but that doesn't mean they're not important. Uh, I think you're, you're, uh, you're seeing some of that around, uh, uh, you know, the kids who are, who are, are being cared for in part by the state right now, Carolyn Jarvis is, as uh, at uh, Global's done some really uh, incredible investigative work around that actually during the campaign. And that's like another area where there's clearly something that needs to be fixed. You're never going to get, you know, some great political benefit for doing it. But, but frankly, the job of being in, in government is you have to fix those kinds of things. And, uh, and so, you know, you, you try, try to do the right things. Never a bad, it's never, never a bad maxim in this business. No, that's for sure. Corey, thank you for this conversation and thank you for being so revealing about what you think about all this stuff. I appreciate it very much. I've got to say to you, uh, I've never seen a better campaign. Uh, so congratulations. Outstanding. And to Nick as well, who I know was integral to the operation and uh, and, to pre- and to the Premier. Uh, as we said on the Curse of Politics, you didn't really ever have a bad day. You were never on your back foot. Every day was about what you wanted it to be about. And that's magic. Extremely well done. So well, congratulations. Thank you for the very kind words, and I'll I'll, I'll, I'll say the obvious that that you know campaigns are are, are about a couple of things. Uh, you know, I think it, it's really discipline and teamwork. Uh, th- this is this is a team sport, as you know. Uh, you cannot do it without uh, a whole lot of people uh, singing from the same song, song sheet and and having the discipline to do that day after day. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's a big group of people, but the most important person through all, all of this is, is very clearly and obviously the premier. Uh, you know, uh, I, I, I'm only able to, to work in this job and, you know, uh, and uh, Jamie, I mean, Nick, uh, others uh, who played central roles in this were there at the pleasure of him. And, and, uh, and believe me, he, uh, if he disagrees, uh, he'll let you know. And uh, then does it take, he does make all the calls. All right. What's next for you, man? Uh, I'm, I'm going to go back to my company and uh, uh, and uh, resume life as it uh, as it was prior to uh, prior to the campaign. So, uh, uh, but I'll be around and uh, probably continue to do some some commentary because uh, I find that fun. And right. I'll, I'll for sure be continuing to listen to uh, the Hurley Burley and the Curse of Politics as uh, they're two of my favorite podcasts. So, I'll be I'll be hearing more from you than you will be from me. Well, that, that's that's unless I can drag you out for some beer. That's unless I can drag you out for some beer. And maybe maybe we'll go see the riders when they're in town. 
I would love that. Yeah. All right. I'd like to thank our presenting sponsor, TELUS, and our sponsor, CN Rail, for their support of uh, the Hurley Burley and the Curse of Politics podcast. And uh, thank you all for listening and watching. We'll be back next week with more Hurley Burley. Hurley Burley. Hurley Burley. Hurley Burley. Hurley Burley.